True Christianity by J.C. Ryle Number 1. True Christianity has always taught the inspiration, sufficiency, and supremacy of Holy Scripture. It has told men that God's written word is the only trustworthy rule of faith and practice in religion that God requires nothing to be believed that is not in this word, and that nothing is right which contradicts it. It has never allowed reason or the voice of the church to be placed above or on a level with Scripture. It has steadily maintained that, however imperfectly we may understand it, the old book is meant to be the only standard of life and doctrine. Number two, true Christianity has always taught fully the sinfulness, guilt, and corruption of human nature. It has told men that they are born in sin, deserve God's wrath and condemnation, and are naturally inclined to do evil. It has never allowed that men and women are only weak and pitiable creatures who can become good when they please and make their own peace with God. On the contrary, it has steadily declared man's danger and vileness and his pressing need of a divine forgiveness and atonement for his sins, a new birth or conversion, and an entire change of heart. Number three, true Christianity has always set before men the Lord Jesus Christ as the chief object of faith and hope in religion as the divine mediator between God and men, the only source of peace of conscience, and the root of all spiritual life. The main things it has ever insisted on about Christ are the atonement for sin he made by his death, his sacrifice on the cross, the complete redemption from guilt and condemnation by his blood, his victory over the grave by his resurrection, his active life of intercession at God's right hand, and the absolute necessity of simple faith in Him. In short, it has made Christ the Alpha and the Omega in Christian theology. Number four. True Christianity has always honored the person of God the Holy Spirit and magnified His work. It has never taught that all professing Christians have the grace of the Spirit in their hearts, as a matter of course, because they are baptized or because they belong to a church. It has steadily maintained that the fruits of the Spirit are the only evidence of having the Spirit, and that those fruits must be seen. It has always taught that we must be born of the Spirit, led by the Spirit, sanctified by the Spirit, and feel the operations of the Spirit, and that a close walk with God in the path of His commandments, a life of holiness, love, self-denial, purity, and zeal to do good, are the only satisfactory marks of the Holy Spirit. Such is true Christianity. Well would it have been for the world if there had been more of it during the last 19 centuries. Too often, and in too many parts of Christendom, there has been so little of it that Christ's religion has seemed extinct and has fallen into utter contempt. This is the Christianity which, in the days of the apostles, turned the world upside down. It was this which emptied the idol temples of their worshippers, routed the Greek and Roman philosophers, and obliged even heathen writers to confess that the followers of the new superstition, as they called it, were people who loved one another and lived very pure and holy lives. Let it never be forgotten that its leading principles are those which are least likely to please the natural man. On the contrary, they are precisely those which are calculated to be unpopular and to give offense proud man does not like to be told that he is a weak, guilty sinner, that he cannot save his own soul and must trust in the work of another, 
that he must be converted and have a new heart, that he must live a holy, self-denying life and come out from the world. Yet, this is the Christianity which is doing good at this day, wherever real good is done. The only religious teaching which can show solid, positive results is that which gives prominence to the doctrines which I have endeavored to describe. Wherever they are rightly taught, Christianity can point to fruits which are an unanswerable proof of its divine origin. There are myriads of professing Christians who have no life or reality in their religion and are only nominal members of Christ's church. Except for going to church on Sundays, they give no evidence of true Christianity. If you mark their daily life, they seem neither to think, nor feel, nor care for their souls, or God, or eternity. Men and women who crowd churches on Sundays, and then live worldly, selfish lives all the week, are the best and most efficient allies of the devil. True faith is not a mere mental assent to certain theological propositions, but a living, burning, active principle which works by love, purifies the heart, overcomes the world, and brings forth much fruit of holiness and good works. Let us live as if we really believed every jot and tittle of Scripture, and as if a dying, risen, interceding, and coming Christ were continually before our eyes. This Puritan devotional has been brought to you by Grace Gems, a treasury of ageless, sovereign grace writings. Please visit our website at www.gracegems.org where you can browse and freely download thousands of choice books, sermons, and quotes, along with select audio messages. No donations accepted. Thank you.